<laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm yeah, I'm Dom. I'm an engineer on the Hubs team. I uh, work on all sorts of things. Uh, but uh, most recently, I worked on the Blender exporter, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, to look down at you over here. <laughs> oh, wait, I looked the wrong way. Shit. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, yeah. There's no sound from your mic. You can only hear me. <laughs> All right, he is adjusting. He is adjusting his audio. Uh, we should be good. Uh, how is it now? Can you hear me? You should be able to hear me. Yay. Oh, man, we had this whole introduction where I said yeah. who I was. All right, I'm Jim. I'm one of the artists... Uh, Working on the Hubs team at Mozilla. Joining me today is Dom. Dom, everybody did hear you. I've already done my intro and you've heard my part, so um, good. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to welcome everybody joining us live on Twitch today. But uh, this is uh, our first like home edition, uh, at least for me, of, of doing a live stream. So uh, hopefully my bandwidth holds up. Um, and yeah, we were adjusting um, the OBS settings up until about 10 seconds before we yeah. uh, started, so we'll no, see how... No, we know a lot <laughs> of things about Hubs, we know a lot of things about Spoke and Blender, not a lot of things about uh, Twitch and OBS and things like that, yep. but we're, we're working on it. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, today basically what we're going to be talking about is the Hubs Blender exporter that Dom here has worked on, and... Uh, Dom, why don't you tell us a little bit about why why did why did we make a Hubs Blender exporter and yeah, tell us a little bit sure. about it. Sure. Yeah. So um, in Hubs, um, you know, most people already know like uh, the main 3D model format we use is uh, GLTF or GLB, um, and we added a custom extension um, to GLTFs um, to support components. Um, so uh, it, you can add behavior um, into your GLTF files by attaching components to different nodes um, in the GLTF tree. Um, this is exactly what Spoke does. So when you add an element in Spoke or uh, you know you bring in a video or an image, what it's actually doing under the hood is creating a GLTF component. And then when you export it, you get just a, a normal GLTF file, but it has the Mozilla Hubs um, component extension in it. Um, what we uh, what the Blender exporter is for is for basically creating kind of like smart GLTF files. So you can add components um, into your GLTF files just as you would exporting out of Spoke, um, but you can use that, put that into the, the, the different components. So for example, if you want to create an avatar, you can add, uh, you know, the different audio feedback uh, components we have. You can bring in, you can um, add components to a, uh, to a GLTF and then bring it into Spoke and compose your scene out of kind of smarter building blocks. Um, and then also we're, we recently added uh, the ability to add light maps. So like we're going to use the Blender exporter as a place to add any sort of additional stuff to GLTFs that aren't supported across the board, but we want to support in hubs. Cool. That was a great explanation. And yep. I think for, for most people, if they're familiar at all with GLTF, they may have struggled at times where there were things they knew that it could do, but it involved a lot of like text editing and having to go mm -hmm. in manually into like a JSON file and, you know, edit, uh, you know, various things. And if you're like me, I'm terrible at that uh, <laughs> and trying to match up curly braces and parentheses and things and wondering why the thing fits out error. So for me, this, this exporter for Blender has been huge. Um, and I'll just talk really quick. Uh, I have the, the link up top on the top right there on the GitHub page for this. Um, and check back once in a while, you, you will see there are you know, bug fixes and things like that that show up. Um, if you're mm -hmm. active on our Discord at all, you'll see um, usually we're, we're some of the first people to find those, those problems, at least I am. Um, but yep. if you want to install this into Blender, we can talk about that uh, briefly. Um, uh, yeah, if you go over to the releases page uh, here uh, in, in GitHub, 
Uh, where is that? How do I get to that? I always have trouble getting <coughs> to the releases. I Somewhere. thought they were like on this uh, strip here, but... Uh, I think it might have gotten moved to the sidebar there. Oh, get it. can Are you? Maybe not. Uh, oh, four releases. There they are. Look at them. Yep, that, yep, that is a that tiny is. little link. Yes. Right <laughs> so if you click on that, you'll see all the different versions we've come up with. And we usually have like little release notes about what we what we changed. Um, but then if you scroll down to the bottom of the release, so there, there'll be a download. Uh, the bottom of the top release. So scroll right. up. And it's then the you can click download. One. You can click download source there. You can download uh, zip. Yep. grab this zip file. Now, the cool thing about Blender, uh, you may or may not know this, is that you don't have to do all kinds of unzipping and putting in proper folders. Um, Blender has it so that in their add-ons, you can, uh, in the preferences, select that zip file, and it'll install it from there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to switch over to Blender so we can look at that. Hopefully, it'll capture this window. But um, basically, you go to uh, preferences. Sorry, it's edit preferences uh is it capturing this window no now? it's not no it's not epic well flow. anyway <laughs> in the add-on section which is the default thing it opens up you can just uh there's a little install button at the top and then you can point it at that zip file you downloaded and it'll show up um and it'll show up listed as uh hubs blender exporter under like generic um and so from there, there's links to documentation, which will basically take you back to that GitHub page. Um, and it's fairly straightforward to use. So let's get more into that. Um, what do you think is the best thing to show as, a, as an initial uh, um, thing? I don't have a cool model or anything loaded up. I just uh, kind of want well, to if show you, where Well, if you just lives. go into the object properties for, um, you know, for this cube, we can just like show adding a component uh, under the... So the object properties is a little orange uh, tab mm -hmm. over here. For to make it a little easier for people, I'm going to use um, nice things that a lot of people don't know in uh, Blender. If you hold Control and then mouse middle click and scroll, you can actually make this panel like. Oh, I did not big. know you could do that. Cool. Uh, so you can just do that. So there it is. You can now see there's this little hubs uh, drop down here. Mm -hmm. If you expand it, there's just a button. It's very simple. It says Add Component. Click on that, and you can see all the different uh, possible things you can add. Uh, in here are things like waypoint, UV scroll, nav mesh, kit. P Some of these are are a little more specific that we won't get into the details of them. But like for for avatars and things, like if you ever wanted to have your avatar play a looping animation, you can like loop animation, and then you put in the name of your animation clip there, and it'll automatically loop. Uh, Loaded in the hubs. Yep, and and Blender doesn't know anything about how to um, like the code behind these components. It's just like the data. Um, so you know you're going to put in this loop animation thing. Blender's just treating that as a, as a you know some text. Um, it's not until it gets into hubs where you know it's actually going to do something. Um, so the, you know there's unfortunately no no way to preview it in Blender here. Um, any of the component things, so you're going to have to export it you know to hubs. But um, you know once you export, it, you can just drag it directly into hubs, and then it, it'll the component will do what it's supposed to do. And you export just like you normally would a GLTF or a GLB. So you just make sure that in the export options, there's a little uh, checkbox. It's the very last thing called mm -hmm. hubs components. And uh, it should be on by default if you've installed this. App. Yeah, unless you turned it off um, and then like saved your settings, it should be on by default. So it'll export if there, uh, if there are components. Because we often get questions from people about uh, their avatars. It's a pretty common one where they say, I'm in, uh, you know, I, I made this avatar. I wasn't really sure what I was doing, but I got it into hubs and it's cool, but the head doesn't move like the other ones when I talk or right, exactly. you know, how do and, I make the mouth move? <laughs> and before our answer to that was like, okay, you're going to need a, to open a text editor and then you're going to need to, yeah. you know, <laughs> find fun. this spot in the thing and then, you know, enter this, this JSON code. So like, uh, yeah, this makes it a lot easier, especially like avatars, I think is what pushed us over the edge to release it externally. Um, internally that we have the whole uh, architecture kit thing. And um, the initial version of the uh, the Blender exporter that Robert uh, built, like kind of the core of this stuff, um, was was to support the the internal creation of the um, the architecture kit. And eventually, we want to be able to have other people submit architecture kits as well. And that you would do that using the Blender exporter. Yeah, if you've been in um, in uh, Spoke, pop over to Spoke for a second. If you've been in here and you've played with the architecture kit um, over here in the bottom. Uh, where it loads up all these 
pieces you can use. These were exported directly out of Blender as one big file. Actually, all those pieces are just sitting in the file, in the Blend file. And um, because I used this uh, add-on, it allowed me to basically tag them as such and then have them... There's, there's, a, there's a procedure to it. It's a little more complicated. But basically, uh, we were able to get them into Spoke as like you know, a, a first order feature like this. And so that's how I did this rock kit as well. This one only has like six or seven uh, pieces, but it was really easy to build these in Blender in one big file and then just have them in here ready to go so that I could drag and drop them in and, and use them. And um, yeah, we want to make that easier for people uh, mm -hmm. to, to do their own, but um, that's, that's pretty much the process there. So uh, let's... Boy, that took a long time. <laughs> yeah, so like the, like that. Uh, I'm going to get out of here, go back to Blender. Boy, managing managing OBS with only one monitor is not fun. <laughs> yeah, we need, a, we need a third person managing the stream. If we were doing this locally, that's, that's kind of what we would do. But Hopefully we need that, but well, hey. This is uh, make it up as we go along. But today, um, to show some of those hubs components, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, which was a, a huge step forward for hubs, I think, and for Spoke, is um, allowing people to create light maps that mm -hmm. they would normally do that sort of process for a game, like a, in a Unity game or, some, or an Unreal or something like that. Um, but uh, traditionally, it's been hard with hubs to... to to use light maps. In fact, the, the whole GLTF ecosystem didn't quite support it the way we needed it to. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we went ahead and, and came up with a way to do that. And if you're not familiar with light maps, it's basically a way to get um, lighting baked into your scene. And I'd, I've done some tutorials on this. If you look back through our Mozilla Reality channel on YouTube, you can find those. So this is a bit of a continuation of those. Um, you may want to, if you're watching this later, you may want to pause it and go back and, and look at a couple of those. But um, uh, what we're going to show is how you can not have to sacrifice the resolution of your base color textures and other textures just to have shadows or, or lighting baked into the object. And this, this should help things look really, really good on mobile, really, really good on things like the Quest. Um, and uh, I'll touch on it later. We're, we're actually in the process of making things look even better on those types of devices. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for now, this is actually a really great way to go in general. So. Yeah, and I mean, even on, um, you know, on desktop systems with, with powerful, um, you know, graphics cards and stuff, um, light maps are still really useful um, because the light baking you can do in Blender um, is quite a bit, you know, uh, better than what you would be able to do real time, um, you know, uh, in, in a real-time engine because you can do indirect lighting. So you can do all the bounce lighting, like you can have light bouncing off of surfaces and onto other things. Um, so it actually like can look better um, than not using a light map. Totally. So I'm going to do a quick kind of like, imagine I'm a user who knows how to use Blender a bit, but I, but I, you know, I just want to get my cool scene in. And I, I, I sort of struggled with the idea of this. I thought, should it, should I grab something off like Sketchfab or Google Poly or something and try to, convert that there's a lot of complications with that because you never know how the author of those objects you know created their textures or how they laid things out or whatever so i figured it'd be better to start fresh um so this is kind of cool if you're uh, a blender user and maybe you've never really uh delved into the whole you know lighting and and that sort of stuff i'm going to make it sort of generic that way but um hopefully this will help you i have my uh assuming it's showing i have my um keystrokes and and mouse clicks uh, showing at the bottom there, on the bottom left. Are they showing for you, Dom? Do you see? Um, for some reason, Discord stopped showing me your screen. I don't, oh, that's all right. Trying to figure I that think, out. Uh, I think, <laughs> but I think they were working. I think it's second, working. Yeah. If I turn this, oh, there we go. yeah, yeah, they're yep, working. Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, and Blender may crash. I know that's like uh, blasphemy. Blender barely crashes ever, but when OBS is running for some reason, it, it's I've had a few problems. So worst case, I have to open it back up again and hopefully not start over. But uh, so what I'm going to do here is start with this, uh, believe it or not, the Blender Cube, the old cube <laughs> that comes up when you do a new scene. Um, I recently discovered this cube, everybody thinks is a one meter cube. It's actually a two by two by two meter cube. Uh, 
that was news to a lot of people. All right, let me see. I'm just going to move this up a little bit. I like to start it actually on the floor. By default, it starts like in the floor. Um, but for getting the scale right, um, this is usually what I do. I just hit G and G. I'm in edit mode. One moves it up one meter. Now it's sitting on the ground. Um, and it makes it a little easier to scale from here and kind of use the grid. A lot of times I like to turn on the increment snapping and I make sure that I turn on absolute grid snap. This will actually make it behave more like uh, Spoke does, where I can grab things like a face and hit G to move it, hit X to pick the axis, and then it'll just snap along the grid like that. Um, the other thing, you know, we can just kind of do it quickly by selecting all of it. I just A and then hit S for scale, and then I'm going to hit Shift Z, which will scale on X and Y, but not Z. Then I'll hit like four. Now it's four times the size. Axes. So just so you're aware, each one of these grid lines is a meter. So this isn't a particularly big room right now. It's only eight by eight. Um, I want to go a little bit bigger. I'm going to go scale. Shift two. There. Now it's a nice big. Um, always helps to know what kind of a space you're making, but I'm just really, really trying to get to the point where we're setting up lighting and stuff. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, laboring over what it's going to be. I'll hit two. That's too tall. And if you're wondering how big an avatar is in hubs, which is a question, um, one thing you can do as a guide, and I do this sometimes, sometimes I actually bring in the little icon that, that uh, folk use to show the avatar. But just if you make a cylinder in here and you set the radius to about point so, and the depth, which is like the height of it, to like, uh, I don't know, like 1.6 or 1. Mm -hmm. that's, about, that's about how big an avatar is. And then I'm going to go into edit mode so that I move the verts, not the pivot point. So I like the pivot point where it is. It's at the origin. I'm going to hit GB.8. That should move it. Yeah, I mean, we've had people ask us, like, how, how tall is an avatar? And, and that's actually kind of a complicated question because, um, you know, if you're um, using a browser in 2D mode, um, we do set your, your height. I think it is to 1.7 meters. Um, but if you're using a VR headset, uh, the avatar is as tall as you are. So, um, you know, the rules for how big should you make a space or how, you know, all this sorts of stuff, uh, really you borrow from architecture, right? It's, it's, it's just like designing a real world space. Um, because you need to account for people of different heights and, and sizes and like and avatars and hubs can also be kind of arbitrarily big too like um you know, th there's nothing sure. specifically limited them to them to a size but kind of working with like okay what is an average um person size uh, and height um you know basically borrowing from all the rules of of designing spaces uh for real life yeah exactly and it's even different like when you design for video game levels if it's say like a third person shooter mm -hmm. or some kind of game like that, like an adventure game, um, in third person there's this uh, sort of strange phenomenon where you tend to have to make your props a little bit bigger than you think. Um, yep. Otherwise, everything looks tiny. Um, I don't actually understand why that happens. I think it has to do with the camera uh, field of view, things like that. But yeah, it's kind of funny. Like if you ever go into you know uh, view uh, assets from a game in VR. Um, you'll realize how like horribly uh, you know incorrect uh, they are, and 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 also often in games you tend to move at just kind of very unrealistic speeds. So like if you know if you go look at a, a map from Half Life or something like that, um, you'll realize like all the hallways are like super long and all this sort of stuff because you're because you're you're flying through them. Yeah, they um, have to make them extra big. Um, mm -hmm. So in this case, it's actually not really the case um, because you're playing in first person, and also if you are in a VR headset, you kind of want things to be scaled the way they actually are in real life. So when mm -hmm. you go through a doorway, it feels like a doorway. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that even though our avatars don't actually collide with one another, can't really bump into somebody, there is a comfort level of like how big a doorway is or a hallway if you're moving through it with other people so you don't feel like you're crammed together. So um, I, I tend to make doorways and things like that a little bigger than they need to be in real life. Um, but you know, it, it gives you a little bit of... Uh, Social distancing, so to speak. Mm -hmm. How relevant. All right. So uh, with this with this thing, uh, one of the things that I like to do when I'm working is turn on uh, back face culling because often I'm building interiors and it's fine if you're like building a model like this, but I want to I need to be able to see there and I don't want to have to go into wireframe mode to do it. So mm -hmm. um, I go up into the 
I'm in the normal viewport shading mode, which is solid mode uh, with no textures. But inside there, there is a checkbox for back face culling. And right now that doesn't help us because if we go in, the, the faces are facing out. Um, but I can quickly just select all the faces and hit Alt N, which opens up the little normals menu. Flip. Okay, and now, now I can see in no matter where I am. That's a lot easier to deal with instead of having to adjust your camera and stuff. Now, if you, if you are inside and you're looking around and it feels a little bit um, like you have blinders on, uh, the other thing you can do is open up the view menu in here and change your camera's focal length. If you lower it, say, to like half of what it is, like 25 millimeters, you'll get like a wider angle lens, hmm. uh, which helps a lot when you're just trying to move around and not, not keep flipping outside. So the only thing to be aware of is that Blender, uh, this setting is different per workspace and per window. So like if I switch over to, to say UV editing mode, I've got to set it there too mm. um, and set all the settings like the back face culling and all that. But um, you kind of get used to that after a while in Blender, but um, seems like a curse at first, but it is kind of a blessing at the most recently. Yeah, I mean, I could see that you would want that. You would want to be looking at it in different ways depending on what you're doing. Yeah, like if you're editing textures, you might want mm -hmm. a totally different like wide view. So anyway, th this is a little too basic. I want to add some detail to this because we're going to have lighting in here that's going to bounce around and make all kinds of interesting uh, you know, throw patterns and things on the walls. And you know, if we don't have any windows or anything, this is kind of boring. Um, so uh, just some, some quick little modeling things. I'm going to just hit in edit mode, and I'm going to hit Control R. And when you roll over any edge, it tries to cut across. And you can use your mouse wheel to turn this up a little bit. Turned it up like two notches. Click, slide these around. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to hit right click to end it. I'm going to do the same thing in the opposite direction and uh, get some more uh, subdivisions there. And then just to make things a little more interesting, I'm going to grab uh, one of these wall parts at the end here and extrude a little bit. I'll just hit E and then like uh, two, four, uh, four, minus. You can always hit the minus after the fact and it'll, there it is, like a little alcove there. That'll make it a little more interesting. And then let's pitch the roof a little bit. What I'm going to do is grab the vertices across the top here. I'm going to hit G. Go up a little bit. Grab direction and then mount. So got a little bit of a roof. We have, still have no windows in here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just uh, go back into face mode and not do it on Grab these top faces. Nice that you can select them from the outside. Mm. Um, and I'm going to do a couple things here. I'm going to inset them. Now, when you go to inset, a lot of times nothing happens because you have to kind of grab this thing and move your mouse. And, or it doesn't do what you want it to. So don't fret. Uh, go a little bit. And then I'm going to give you this little menu you can open up. And I don't want them all together. I want them done individual. So click that. Now I've got little individual panels like that. I can adjust how much big I want these skylights to be. Pretty cool. Um, and then one last thing I'll do is extrude them, uh, I should say outward, but like inward a little bit, just so that there's a frame, a little bit of a frame that doesn't look like a paper thin wall. Um, so to do that, I'm going to use the extrude along normals option here. And I like this one because uh, they'll, they don't go straight up. They actually go along, along the, the direction. Face normals. Face. That's cool. Okay. And, then, and then the last thing I'm going to do is actually just delete those uh, faces. X faces. Um, and so now I've got holes uh, for light to come through above. Uh, now, it also might be a little more interesting to have a little bit of light on the walls. If you're building a VR space, one of the conundrums you might run into is like, Okay, I know what I want to make, but the background, what am I going to do for the background? I don't want to have to like build an entire uh, landscape to be out of. Um, so a lot of times people will use like a sky box or a sky dome of sorts. Um, but if you take my advice, uh, one way around that is to not let you really see out the window. Make them too hot, <laughs> like you're in a basement or a garage or something. 
Um, so I'm going to hit uh, Control R again while I'm in edit mode. I'm going to cut all the way around the whole building like that. Uh, so I'm going to hit click once, and then this time I'm actually going to slide it up out there. Because I'm, I'm, I want to split these walls up a little bit. Now it kind of bugs me. Guys, um, I'm going to grab those points that are up there. Level with the, the lines. Next thing mode. The pull over one of these level. I feel better about that already. <laughs> then the last thing I'm going to do is uh, go back into face mode and select these uh, windows around the outside. Maybe I'll do N1. Those two. And then I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to inset faces, but set it to. I also went way too far. And then I'll do the same thing. I'm going to extrude them out along their normals. Bit. That. Yes, I'm sorry I mentioned in chat that in Half-Life Alex they have windows um, that contribute lighting, but they're just kind of blanked out white so you can't see through them. Um, so you can kind of get the light coming in through them, but you don't. they don't actually look like, like frosted windows. glass. Exactly, kind of. yeah. I actually yeah. really like that technique was really effective. For indoors, it still felt like there was light coming. But a lot of that had to do with the uh, the quality of the light, like sort of mm -hmm, a soft mm -hmm. and like cool light, contrast with the interior warm warm light. Yeah, in one in one of the tutorials you did um, the earlier on ones, you you know you used an HDR um, light map to kind of create just the basic background lighting. I don't know if you were planning on doing that. With I this, am actually planning on doing that. I think that's yeah, a great cool. technique. So, yeah, and, and I think that'll you... that'll really help with with uh, just kind of providing a natural backdrop for all this stuff. You can have all the natural lighting kind of coming in, and then you can accent it with with additional scene lights. Yeah. Um, and I, I like that because um, it takes away a lot of the guesswork. Plus, mm -hmm. the the using a, a sky box, basically, for image-based lighting, they call that, um, gives you a lot more color. And instead of just like one harsh sunlight or something, you get, get sort of the colors of the background and stuff, and it looks very mm -hmm. natural. So this is a pretty good start. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and save this. Um, in case Blender crashes. In case Blender crashes, <laughs> and um, I'm just going to save this. Call this, like, very, very creative naming. All right, so um, this is a good start, uh, but it's very boring. And if I were to actually just export this and bring it into Spoke, uh, it would look really flat. It would look a lot like this uh, mm -hmm. in the port, and it would be, like, on mobile, it would look, Pretty, pretty bad. Uh, oh, yeah, know. mobile would look especially bad because you wouldn't even get like the, the kind of different surface highlights. You would just would see kind of basically like some completely blank surface. This. It would be like flat. Exactly. It would look like that, and it'd be very hard to use on a phone <laughs> or, a v or a mobile VR headset. Uh, and Blender, Blender's lighting is super cool. So uh, let's. Uh, this is a bit of a repeat from what I did in one of the tutorials, but I'm going to go into the shading. <laughs> Uh, mode here. Ignore my crazy uh, shader here. This is the default one that I'm, uh, I'm going to start with a new shader on this. Um, and I'm going to turn down the base color a bit. It's a little bright. Around 0.7 or so. Uh, if you're doing physically based uh, materials, like 0.7 is pretty high actually on the, the base color. Um, and I don't really need any shininess. Like I know I can turn the roughness way down and it'll look like this glossy. Mm. room whatever i to make things simpler i bring the roughness all the way up just so that it's like you know, not reflecting um that gives you a, a much more accurate indication of what it'll look like later so um i will actually well focal length. okay so this would be the most basic thing right just a, a mesh with a material and you could export it but we want something better than that we want some lighting and stuff so uh, I'm going to switch over in the shader editor to the world mode this one is a little bit hidden from people but if you go to world you'll see that the background it's using is just a gray color um, and even though in this viewport you see that it's really just making this gray background and that's not doing us any favors for looking realistic so 
What I do is I go to add texture and then I add an environment texture. Now the environment texture is looking for specifically equal rectangular or mirror ball images. Um, and I happen to have a bunch of them on my machine already. If you're interested in finding these for free, um, pop over here really quick. I talked about this other video, but um, you can go to HDR Haven. I remember the name I of the site. <laughs> HDRIHaven.com. And this has all kinds of free um, Creative Commons licensed um, background images that are already in the right format um, for stuff like Blender. And just go to like gallery and you can for different things. Just click on the HDRIs thing. They, they have them categorized by all different types. I should probably grab some of these. Cool. Um, <laughs> The thing to be aware of is that they are different and these samples are really helpful to see on these because some of them have very, very soft lighting where you're not getting like harsh shadows at all. You're getting like, looks like overcast sort of, you know, soft light. And then other ones are very, very harsh or nighttime or something like that with a lot of contrast. Um, in the case of me, I'm using ones that came with um, Substance Painter and Substance Designer. Um, and I just load them in here. Got them. And they're easy to use. Yeah, I mean, the exact contents of the image don't necessarily matter. Like, you know, if, if, if like, you know, you see a thing and you're like, oh, I don't, that quite, that doesn't quite match the scene I want. Like, what you're looking for is like kind of the, the overall lighting that that thing is going to provide. Like, you don't actually have to use that image as your skybox or anything in the actual rendered model. This is just going to help provide kind of some background lighting to everything to make it look more natural. Exactly. And in order to see this, I need to go to the textured uh, view up here in the little shader balls. Um, and by default, it's showing whatever the one is in here. And you can switch to different ones in here, but these are really just for the viewport. They are not actually affecting rendering at all. Um, so they're kind of nice just for getting tones and thinking about if I want it to look warm or cool or whatever, but um, they're not actually going to do any, have any influence over the lighting right now. What will is if you use this world view down here, plug the color into the background node. And what will happen Nothing. You're not actually going to see it <laughs> do anything, which is like, what? What you actually have to do is switch to scene world here. And now when I turn on scene world, it actually changes that background into the one that I picked. Um, you can also turn on scene lighting, lights. I'm going to do now while I'm in here because put actual lights in there. But again, I'm still not really seeing the effect on the scene. It's not until I'm in a more rendered kind of mode that it'll work. And specifically the cycles renderer that comes with Blender. Uh, the default renderer is the EV renderer, um, but that's not really gonna do it for us. So I have to switch over to this rendered mode, which does virtually nothing at first. You're like, well, because it's still using the same renderer. So I'm gonna go up to the render property tab change this topmost thing from EV mm -hmm. cycles. When you switch to cycles, you're going to see stuff happen. And hopefully your computer is powerful enough. Mine is powerful enough. Other stuff. Time. Yeah, suggestion from chat. Make sure you keep saving because <laughs> making want people nervous. Away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just control S to everybody. So look at that. I'm actually getting the lighting from that background image. Um, complete with uh, shadows coming through from the sun. Um, it's super grainy, you may notice. Um, and every time I move around, it has to re-render, so it's kind of grainy. And buttery, pixelated thing. But um, the other thing to be aware of is that with the Cycles renderer, it automatically makes all surfaces double-sided. So my back face culling thing is not helping me now. Mm -hmm. uh, once I'm in this mode. So changing your focal length might help so you can get inside here and around. But take a look. You've got these uh, streaks of light coming through. And the direction that it's coming from is all because of this background. Here's the sun. It's actually coming from that location. But beyond that, that actual sunlight, you're actually getting all of this bounced lighting that's happening and color information from the sky out there and from the grass and the 
other thing kind of spilling into here. Which is super cool. There's like so little that you have to do to make this look good. The only thing is it's super grainy and hard to see. And you can see my path tracing thing is slowly creeping up to there it's done, 32. But that is still really, really grainy. One really cool thing that they added, um, assuming that you have a GPU that supports it or a CPU that supports it, is viewport denoising. They added this right under the uh, sampling section here. Oh, cool. I, I happen that. to have this optics AI accelerated uh, thing. It'll work with my NVIDIA card. But watch this magic. It's like, oh, grainy. And then all of a sudden it's like, nope, I got it. And it figured out how to make it oh, more yeah. grainy. Oh. It looks amazing. Um, and it's still building up samples and looking better and better as I sit here and don't. But um, wow, what a difference. Um, so I'm going to leave that on uh, so that it's a much nicer thing to look at. Now let's try changing to a different um, background image. That one has the sun pretty low in the sky. And so the, the light is not hitting the ground at all. I like this one, this cave entry forest, like very green, um, but very soft. You can see oh, wow. now the, the shadows are really soft coming in. And kind of coming from more directions because, you know, the, the presumably the sun here is probably more overhead. Yep. Here's one that's like the sun is pretty straight overhead. Yep. Um, we're not quite straight. Where's the one I was thinking? There's one that I have that, that uh, it might be like an interior. So this bus garage is very, very soft light. It's overcast, but warm. Mm -hmm. um, and the studio that I used in the tutorial video that I made before, kind of soft too. But I, I want something a little, little more extreme. So I'm going to try this one that I have. Um, and what's really cool about this image-based lighting stuff is it's not like, you know, the image says, okay, here's the sun and have, you know, have this be a light source. It's literally just the image um, kind of just contributing just from the natural light that you're seeing in the image, um, you know, acting as a light. Um, and so you can kind of do some pretty crazy stuff and match, really match what the environment um, would would look like, uh, like what something in that environment would look like. I think I, I like this one. This one gives me a lot of light on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, it's bouncing light up onto the walls. Um, so the corners look dark as they should, but I'm I'm getting some some warm color coming onto the walls over here. And boy, what a difference that makes just for the, the look of the scene. Now, bear in mind, you're not stuck with that at all. Um, I did this in the tutorial, but you can still add other nodes um, like this one called mapping. Plug that in to your breaks things at first. And then you're also gonna add one called um, texture coordinate very first uh, node on there, plug that in, topmost one. Now it looks the way it did before, except now I have control over the rotation of mm -hmm. the background. Let me switch to a non-rendered uh, mode just so you can see that. So there's that background. As I turn the Z rotation, it'll actually change the light direction um, as I do that. Now you can do other things that are not cool, like uh, sliding it left and right, but yeah, that's going to be weird. <laughs> now you, but, but, you know, in a pinch, assuming you're not going to use this background and actually see it rendered, um, you can rotate it on other axes. Too, like if yeah, exactly. I mean, like, uh, you know, even if you're not trying to build your scene to be in an alley here, which you're, you know, you're probably not, um, you know, you're just kind of trying to match the lighting of, of this environment. And so you can use a completely different skybox. I mean, obviously using the same exact skybox is going to kind of, mesh the best in terms of, of of being natural lighting but um you know it doesn't it doesn't have to match exactly what you want what you want to see out out the windows exactly and so now i can i can rotate this around to change the direction that the light's coming in if i want mm -hmm. and if you're like me you could spend probably like all day just i'm not going to do that because people are watching and <laughs> but uh it's kind of fun like if if for example if i was going to use this room for a uh you know a, a meeting place or something like that or i was going to put a screen on the wall over here i may not want the sun hitting that wall right. so i could really go in and just fine tune that i like that right there okay let's let's go with that 
Um, and then one last thing, I did not do this on the other tutorial. Um, you're not even stuck with the color because you could add something like um, a mix RGB mm. node after your image and you could play around with like tinting it. So if you were like, oh, I want it like colder, you could like tint it blue and get a different effect. Oh, yeah, a, that's it, cool. it is affecting the background in a weird way. Um, but you could play around with like, oh, I just want to adjust the color or the contrast. Play with the slider a little bit. So uh, lots of options here. And I haven't even made a light. I didn't put one light in this scene. Just using an <laughs> yeah, and it already scene. looks like really great. I mean, like this, and, and like I was saying before, um, you know, even for desktop systems, like this looks way better than what you would get by real-time rendering this in hubs um, with just the normal 3JS, you know, PBR materials. like you're not going to get um, surfaces and the, the corners, the ambient occlusion there you're getting, like all that stuff looks way better. So even if you're not just trying to optimize for mobile, um, setting up a scene like this is actually kind of the way you get really good looking stuff. I mean, a, a lot of the, uh, the apart posters gallery, um, a lot of people um, really like how that looks. And, and a lot of that is just the lighting. Like they did a really good job of lighting it very naturally. It feels like an art gallery because it's lit like an art, art gallery and like, um, you know, using they actually didn't even use light maps for that. Um, they 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 baked it into the um, the diffuse textures like you did in the in the previous tutorials. They would have liked um, to have this, but they would have, exactly like if if this was available when they were working on that, they definitely would have used it. And like um, you know, they may up, upgrade uh, to this now that this is available. And you can see here, I can even just adjust the slider of this background node to darken uh, by turning it down a little bit. It's just basically kind of like affecting the exposure of that image. Um, so if you were going to use a lot of interior lighting, you might want to, you know, make your outside not as bright or make it look like nighttime by tinting it bluer and darkening it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to leave it as is. I, I kind of like the way it looks. I do want to get rid of this cylinder, though, because it's actually going to end up casting a shadow, uh, like some mysterious shadow that we'll see later and be like, what is that? <laughs> um, so I'm going to get rid of fake avatar and uh, just have it look like that. Now, uh, from here, I just want to point out, you are totally you know, free to add lighting if you want. Um, so for example, in this scene, um, if I were to say add a, I don't know, like a point light, um, move it up a bit, of course it keeps recalculating shadows. I'm going to switch over to like yeah. this mode while I work. Um, and I'm just going to slide it along like closer to the wall over here. Now there's a point light there as if it were like a lamp or something. Um, I usually turn color something warmer maybe, decent light or an LED light, and then you know play with the wattage of the light. Here's a 40 watt light. Um, and now switch back to rendered mode. You'll see that'll that'll contribute as well to render. So um, you're totally free to use both. You can use image based lighting, you can uh, manually created lights. One thing that would be cool to show too is if you could put in a put in an object that has a color, um, you know, like, like, like a purple, or... yeah, or or not even like an emissive, but like make a make a purple object, and then you can see the bounced lighting off of it, like the indirect. Um, oh, good point. You know, light light will bounce onto a purple surface, and then like in real life, the light coming off that surface is gonna is gonna be purple now. Um, and so let's give um, this um, Taurus that I just made a, like a bright red color. Mm -hmm. Like you said, purple. Let's do. Tom's a fan purple is purple. objectively the best color, so it's, uh, you know. My son would agree with you. Uh, let's <laughs> see. Uh, he's in a purple phase right now. Let's see. Go, let me go to, um, I just set the roughness high, but let, let's go back to the rendered mode. And you will see there is now purple. Hard to see, but it's spilling off onto the floor now. Um, tiny bits of purple there if I zoom in. And I assume if you change the roughness of that surface, that'll actually, like, reflect more or less light. It too, will. Right? Like, if I turn it down so it's shinier. It reflects more yeah and same with the obviously with the background although shininess and stuff is a trickier thing to deal with when you're talking about baked lighting so we're not really going to get into that but um yeah and then one last little thing is if you use a an object like this like a mesh um but instead make it emissive by using the emission value here i'm going to change it from black my eyedropper and make like a bright lit purple, as if it was a light mm -hmm. or a screen or something that was lit up. That will really affect your lighting. 
Um, yeah, I mean that'll that'll act as if that object is a, itself a light and like actually it's, emitting light. Like it's glowing um, yep. and will light up the scene. Now you would see it a lot more if I darkened the um, skybox, but let me mm -hmm. slide it over into this darker area. There, look, it's lighting up that whole alcove in purple. Yep. Yeah, and so you can see like even it's like a lot. It's bouncing around in there too, um, and you're getting a lot of the indirect, indirect uh, light bounces in there. Pretty cool. So yeah, so you can you can light that way too if you want to make like Tron world where everything has, you know, lit up uh, little lights everywhere or, or corners of the room are all little lights or something. totally do that. It's a question of how 100% metallic objects render in Spoke. I mean, so I think in in hubs and Spoke. Um, well, it depends on how how we um, export this, but I assume since we're going to use light maps, we're going to probably export this as as an unlit thing, and so then those those properties don't actually affect anything at runtime anymore. Um, but if you're using the normal PBR um, shader um, and you have you know some surface uh, highly reflective, uh, we do apply an environment map in hubs, and so you would see the kind of environment map reflected, uh, but you wouldn't see you know if an avatar walked up to it, you wouldn't see that reflected in the surface or anything like that. Um, you would just kind of see the environment map. Very good question. My my favorite uh, type of light. I did this in tutorial, but um, actually really like uh, area lights. Uh, yeah, the the little strips, like yeah, because you yeah, can those, you can really cool. use them in very controlled ways, like even just as like a sconce or a light like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that looks really cool because it just comes out of one plane like this, and you can change it to a disc, change it to a rectangle. I did this uh, before where I shrunk the uh spread it out like that and then i shrunk it down okay right and i'll turn it up and then if you had like a visual component here where you know you actually had a light a light fixture there um that that would be that would look you know pretty awesome like a light exactly the wall i mean even without a light fixture there like your mind kind of <laughs> pictures kind of one there because it's, it's like coming from yeah. somewhere a recessed area or something yeah um yeah yay blender Blender, you're the best. Fanboy. Talk. Uh, so anyway, once you have uh, something set up that you like. Um, save, save file warning. Let's save it. Let's save it. <laughs> Control S. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and then the only thing is, in order to get all of this uh, stuff out into Spoke and into Hubs, is we need to bake this lighting. Now, what I had people do before was just bake everything down into the diffuse or what we call the base color texture. Um, that's fine if it's just going to be white like this. But as soon as you start adding textures like bricks and floor tiles and things on the wall, then you're going to run into problems because the way that we had you do it before uh, meant that you might have to sacrifice some resolution in order to get a nice crisp looking light map or light, uh, light bake. So uh, what I'm going to do here is something new. So in order to do this, uh, well, the first part won't be new, but you can see what I'm doing here. So what we need to do is create a, an empty texture that we're going to bake this lighting information into. Um, before I do that, it's always important to look at the UVs of your model. I did nothing for the model yet, so it is not going to bake properly. Everything is probably overlapped. And so I'm going to go to the UV editing workspace and Go into edit mode and select everything, and let's see how it is laid out. Oh, it's a mess. Sort of. Eh, I can make out the skylights. I can make out the windows. Um, it might you might be tempted to just say ship it. It's good. Um, but things like the edges of these windows that I extruded um, are not laid out. They're they're all mm -hmm. coming toward us, and they're not going to get. They're not going to capture any textures properly or, or lighting. So. Um, what I really need to do is select everything and unwrap it again. Now, if you just use the regular unwrap, you will be sorely disappointed in what it does because uh, it just does this. That's not right. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> instead, you either want to use one of these other ones like cube projection, which tries to map to like six sides of a cube, although that one has a lot of weird overlaps. Um, you can do it manually face by face and projecting from the view. I don't recommend that unless you're doing it. Instead, I'm going to use the one called Smart UV Project. Um, and I'm going to set a little bit of an island margin, like 0.0. .0. 
Um, and I don't recommend using stretch to UV bounds. I know that's a default in here, but what that tends to do is to take pieces of this and try to fit them across the map and you end up with some stretch textures. So I turn that off and I hit okay. And then there's all the pieces laid out. Now, cause this set of UVs is for regular texturing, like floorboards and bricks and things like that. It's totally fine if these overlap. It's totally fine if these um, end up being scaled bigger than the texture itself so that you can have tiling bricks and tiling floorboards and things like that. This was not possible before with our, our old workflow. But because light maps are going to be using a separate set of UV, you're free to do whatever you want with it. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to make this simple. Um, but it uh, sounded like you were going to say something. Dumb. Uh, yeah, people in chat are asking, and I was actually going to ask the same question. Is there a reason um, not to use light map pack? Uh, or like, what's the difference between light map pack and... Light map um, pack I am actually going to use. However, I am, I'm going to use that for the, the light map UV. Okay. Oh, so you're just creating UVs for the, the kind just of... Just for the uh, texture. Yeah, texture, the base yeah. texture. Okay. So if I go back to... Now that I've unwrapped that, if I go back here... Rendered. Okay. If I go to... Um, if I make a new image texture, um, and I, I'll, 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 I'll make one of these, like, blender one, color grid, 1024, whatever. Yeah, and and this um, the 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 UV map you're creating for the texture actually um, can be whatever you want. Like you could have all of the faces overlapping if you wanted to. Um, exactly. Like exactly. if you wanted to have a tiling texture and you're just you know you don't want to um, use a bunch of UV space for that. Like you can totally do that. And that's like one of the main advantages um, with um, with light maps is that you can have you can have your um, light map UVs be completely separate where they're going to cover every every face. Uh, and then you can still you can still use um, for texturing. You can still use a completely different set of UVs and separate and, you know, materials. Use, right? Yeah, and like have them have them tiling. Uh, you, you know, you can you can like that was one of the main things you couldn't do um, baking the light maps into uh, the diffuse texture is you can't you can't use a tiling texture right. um, because so, so every, this is every a tiling you, texture. It goes from A one right. to H one and H. You know, you see the the bounds of this thing. And when I look at it up close as a floor, I mean, it's pretty pixelated. That, that's not mm -hmm. awesome. But I would be fine to go into the UV editor and scale all of these up so that I'm tiling it basically across the whole thing. Now it's really sharp, mm -hmm. sharper when I look at it close up. Let's, you can imagine that was a granite floor or wood floorboards or something. And they could be just a texture that tiles infinitely in all directions. And it would be fine to do that. Mm -hmm. And it would be fine to have every single floor piece overlaid on top of each other right. using the same texture repeated again and again. Um, that's often how game textures are made um, for efficiency, right? Like have a wall and it just rolls forever. It's the same texture over and over again. And then maybe yeah, and add if you, a few cracks. And if you wanted to do tiling like this um, in, uh, you know, just using the diffuse map, um, and you wanted to light it, you would have to actually like duplicate it in the image. You'd have to have the tiling things, which would make you have to make a much higher resolution image. And waste a lot of space in a, a way. Lot of space, right? yeah. yeah. Like, oh, just to make that brick look good, it has to be pasted all over the place. So th this is like, I know this is one of the harder concepts, I think, in 3D for people to wrap their heads around this whole U. Um, I've, I've always, I used to teach this stuff and I would always try to come up with analogies and I, I think maybe it, the best analogy is probably still like, you know, thinking of it like a candy wrapper or like wrap, gift wrap around something. Um, you're you're laying it out in such a way that um, you know, it knows what part of a texture to put where. Um, so by doing this, it's like I'm effectively changing that layout. Um, but I don't want to get too far into that, and I don't actually want to use this crazy color thing um, to start, but I am going to lay these out big like that just to show you it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, so we, we can put like a tiling, like granite texture or something on it like later. Yeah, why don't we do... We'll, we'll do or that in now, a little bit. For one. now, I'm going to get rid of this um, and just, yeah, go back to plain white. But my UVs are stretched out and crazy. And the UVs you can see over here in the object pr uh, data properties, the little inverted green triangle under UV maps. That's the default now, the set of UVs that I'm using. You can always see that by going into here, selecting faces, and then you'll see 
up at the top uh, which set of UVs you're looking at. These map pieces. So I'm just going to leave them called UV map, but just know that that's the starting point. Now on to the light map UVs. So somebody asked the question before, why wouldn't I use light map pack? I would. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is um, make a second set of UVs over here just by hitting plus. By default, it calls it UV map dot one. It's actually duplicated this set. Um, I don't really care. I'm going to overwrite them anyway, and I'm going to call it light light map UV. So that's the second set. Uh, right now, they're identical. So when I switch back and forth between, nothing changes. Over. But I'm going to make sure light map UVs are selected, and I'm going to this time uh, light map pack and in here, I have to do a bunch of things. The defaults are usually fine. You may want to define the image size. Now, believe it or not, even though we have a lot of detail in the shadows and things, we can get away with a really, really relatively low uh, texture size for the entire room's shadows. And that's one of the really cool things about this. The cost of doing this is going to be pretty negligible in terms of rendering uh, file size. I'm going to set the image size to 1024. I'll leave the margin as is. That stuff will hit OK. Now it's going to pack everything into one nice, unoverlapping set of rectangles and squares. Um, and that's important. A light map cannot have overlaps. Because if you think about it, if this part of the floor over here has a shadow going across it, you don't want that shadow somewhere else. Like Each, each part has to be unique and has to have its own uh, its own look. Um, so that's why all of these cannot overlap. And see, they have like a little bit of margin between them, and that's fine. Um, if you run into bleeding across, you may want to change those settings when you map, but uh, it's pretty straightforward. So now I have two sets of UVs. I have the original UVs, they're all stretched out here, and then the light map UV. And it's important that they're in that order. Dom can tell us why. Yep. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was about to say that. Like, uh, for Hub specifically, it's important that the second set of uh, UVs is the light map. Um, this is just because um, 3JS, just the way it's it's hard coded um, to have its to expect light maps to be on the second UV channel. Um, the extension we wrote for GLTF um, supports um, you know that being any channel, and so you can export it on any channel. But um, in order for it to work in Hubs, it has to be the second channel. Um, this might be something we fix in the future, or like if we if we modify 3JS. But right now, that's a limitation, and it's not really you know. Well, and uh, it's kind of consistent with Blender because Blender kind of sucks when it comes to this. There's no way to reorder these. They yeah. don't, they don't <laughs> even have a menu to do that, um, and so uh, you kind of just have to deal with it. Like if you end up in the wrong order, you can do some clever like duplicating and then deleting and gaming and stuff to get them in the right order but um, you could probably do it with the python api too i, I bet you could come up with a little script it's kind of funny but because i've been working on this add-on like i know way much more about blender internals than i do about how to actually use blender <laughs> <laughs> so like i could tell you how like the file format is stored and all this sorts of stuff but i don't really know how to i mean i can i can extrude i can do the extruder cube thing but that's about well that's maybe about you're, maybe you're learning some today that's oh like, no i absolutely am learning this is great but, but it <laughs> i think it definitely needs one of these little menus like the others have about like copying and pasting and mm -hmm. whatever. I don't know what, but they will probably. I, I, I have faith in that. So anyway, uh, now we're ready to bake the lighting into those new set of light map UVs that we made. Now, setting that up is important. So we're going to go into the material for this object again. And this time we're going to add an image texture node. And we're going to make a new blank one that I'm just going to call light bake. Uh, uh, what am I going to call it? Light bake uh, start. Because I'm actually going to do some crazy things in a minute. But I want to start with this sort of raw baked light. And it's going to be just a 1024. I think that's great. Um, but I'll leave it blank. I don't want to color or anything. Black is fine. But I'll hit OK. And so if we look at it over here, that is the texture right now. Black. And nothing to it. If I were to actually plug it in, you'd black, but that's not what we're going to do. I'm going to leave this alone. But what I do want to do is, while I'm thinking of it, plug in the proper UV. So to do that, we need to add a node called 
map. The UV map node lets you pick which set of I'm going to pick light map UV, plug that in to my light bake. Any other textures I do on this object are going to use the other set of UV. I'll, I'll do that when I add like bricks or floorboards or something. I'll show but to start with, the only thing you have to remember, if you watched my tutorials, is make sure that this node is selected. It's very important because that's how it targets that bake. Yeah, this is a super surprising thing. I think I think everyone who does light baking in Blender always mentions this. Is like I don't know why they do it this way. It's really weird, but yeah, uh, it feels like something somebody came up with and was like, "This is cool, right?" And everybody's like, "Yes, I don't know." Yeah, I mean, it, it works, but it's just kind of it's. I would not, not have expected that to work that way. And you can easily blow away textures that you weren't expect, you know, weren't meaning to if you have them selected. And I've done it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm going to save again for those of you feeling nervous. And now I'm going to go back over to the render settings, render properties. It's still on cycles. Uh, it's still on CPU, and I have port denoise and all that. Just remember, um, need it on CPU because right now there is no GPU light baking, which is a shame because the GPU is super fast. Uh, at least mine is to baking. But and then we're going to scroll down, and under this bake section, blow up a little bit, see it. Uh, Last time I had you do some like combined stuff. I'm not actually doing that. This time I'm doing diffuse again. Uh, and in this case, because I'm only baking lighting, I don't need color. I only need direct and direct influence. In other words, I don't care about what color the initial the surfaces, surfaces are. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean you can't do that. Like if, you, if, you're, if you're set, you're like, here are the colors of my room, never changing. You know, you can turn that on. I, well, I think I think you want to keep that off because otherwise it'll apply this kind of surface color to the light uh, map, no, and I think right. I think that would I think it would, the surfaces are going to look weird if you do that, because um, like this is this map is just going to contain the lighting information. Um, so you're right. Um, you, Dom is yeah. right. Ignore what I said. Sorry. <laughs> uh, if you're uh, gonna edit the oh well anyway. That's all right. So make sure that this uh, new blank image is selected in your shading thing, and you're going to hit bake. Um, now, before you do that, you may want to first lower the render settings, like the path tracing, to something really low, just as a test. I like to bring it like super low, like four or something, just to make sure it's actually working. And I'm going to hit bake, and then we're going to watch uh, the texture over here when it's done. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a progress meter, very fast. You probably right? want to move that uh, from could, the could corner because that's well, it's it's behind the cameras, oh, behind our faces. <laughs> arg. Okay, let me do better. Did that work? Yes. Okay. Yep. So, so it's super grainy and it's terrible, but it's working. Ah, uh, yes. And someone was asking if the color of the lighting is getting baked into this light map. Yes, it is. Like, yes, so this is. is a color light map, and so you'll see, like, it's not just black and white. Correct. So that's neat, uh, and it's working, but four is way too low. Now you might be tempted to turn it way up because you keep looking at your render and you're like, man, it's so grainy. How do I fix that? Oh, I read in the manual it said turn this up. Uh, I'm going to show you a way around that. Very happy about if you've ever done baking. So I'm gonna And you do you do probably want to turn it up from this really low number. Like I mean, it's going to be a balancing act right. of like the okay, how much is 128. Yeah. Uh, I don't actually think it needs to be that high, but you know, even like half that, like 64 is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um let's see how long 64 takes and whether we can stomach this. I mean, Dom and I can talk for hours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it. you can, um, like, this is going to change, um, you know, uh, denoising is going to help get rid of the graininess, but, like, you know, the, high, the higher this number is, the better overall quality you're going to get. Um, it's just kind of a matter of how long do you feel like having it render. Um, certainly while you're still iterating and checking lights and all this sorts of stuff, like, just keep it low and, 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 and test. Um, but, you know, if you're making a scene and you don't mind that it's going to take three hours to light bake you can you can crank that up and you know it's it's fine um or if you uh, have a second computer or something and you yeah, just exactly. set it as a baking machine rendering machine cool um and there are lots of settings in here you can adjust yeah. to improve things um i'm gonna you can adjust like the number of times lights will bounce like how many surfaces it's going to continue to bounce off of i mean obviously for, i mean for all of these things the higher the higher number the better in terms of just like realism but uh, it's it's gonna you're gonna get diminishing returns 
um, pretty quickly as you start and bumping if, things and up. And if you do have what they call fireflies, these like little light spots on dark walls and things that are, you just can't get rid of, some of that you're maybe never going to be able to get rid of, mm -hmm. you know, without taking a, you know, 40 hour render or something, which is not worth it in my opinion. And I'm going to show you a way to hack around that a little bit. So um, this was at 64. It's pretty grainy. Um, I think I can deal with it though, um, because I'm going to use a special little compositing thing where I just uh, noise it um, all within Blender, which is, it, you might be thinking, can I just bring that in Photoshop and like you know, blur it out? Yeah, sort of, that might work. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, let's see if we can deal with this. This is at 64. Um, I'm tempted to do the 128, but go crazy here. But one thing you do want to do is make sure you save this because right now this is saved to like memory. If I quit out of Blender right now or it crashed, I just, if I quit out <laughs> and then came <laughs> back, that image would be gone and I'd have to render it again. So uh, I'm going to have to go image, and save as, and I'm going to save this in my same, same folder. I know you can't see this right now. I'm going to call it light bake start. Um, I'm actually going to, it's going to save it as a PNG. I'm going to turn all the compression off because I'm going to further do stuff to it. And I don't want to like have multiple sets of compression on. Um, that's not super important, but I found it's not, not press until you. So there it is saved. I have this now saved as an image. I could open it. And thing. But what I'm going to do, actually, before I do that, let's see what it would look like if I plugged this into the base color. Just. So that's with the bake lighting. And you could go ahead and export it and open it in spoke or hubs, and it would look like this, sort of. Not quite yet. A couple. And this, and this is what the, the tutorials that you had written uh, previously more or less um, did this. Uh, they also included that, like, if, if this, um, if you had kept the texture on this thing, like that tile texture or whatever, um, that wouldn't be in this map because you didn't check color. But um, if you had checked color, like, it, it would be all baked into one map and it it you know it works like i think uh like this is what we what people have been doing until we added light maps um just super it's grainy well yeah and, and and like basically the texture resolution you're ha you're gonna have to bump it up you can't you can't use tiled textures on the on the i um... couldn't keep this at 64 and expect you to see detail in like a wood mm -hmm. grain on the floor or something well and the 1024 size of the texture too like you'd, you'd want you, you know you'd have to bump that up if you wanted to to have a you know decent tiling texture of, of wood grain or something like that yeah on the floor yeah and here's some fireflies i'm talking about these little like light spots they're very notoriously hard to get rid of um but i'm gonna do something to cheat that a little bit so uh i didn't know this before i had to sort of learn this but if you've never tried out this compositing tab inside blender it's super cool um, a lot of people use this for video editing and other things like their final renders Blender, but I'm going to use it just to denoise that image. So when you first open the compositor, uh, there's this render layers node and then a composite. That's this is kind of like the material output in the editor, like the final thing. I don't need this first one because I'm not rendering. I've already rendered it. What I do need is under input to add in, just like the material editor. I'm going to choose an image, and then from here open up the image that you saved of your light bake. So where can I find that? Oh, I saved. Okay, so there it is. It loads up uh, nice and grainy, expected. And then there are two nodes I'm going to use to get rid of all the grain on it. And they both start with the D. D. So if you go to add and you go search type D, one of them is denoise, probably the most important one. And the other one is called D speckle. Mm -hmm. And that one will get rid of some of those fireflies I was talking about. Um, now, on each of these nodes, you, they don't need to be set to be HDR. And um, you don't need alpha on this output or anything. But what you'd basically chain these together, take your image, type it into the image of the denoise. Actually, while I do this, also very cool about this thing, there is a node called view, sorry, viewer. If you add a viewer node, puts this little thing in the middle. And you can plug the output of everything uh, to this. So if I plug in 
well, let's do it one at a time. Watch. If I first just plug the image into it, you'll see there it is in the background. Like stays back there. Mm -hmm. um, if I then go through the denoiser and pipe that in, here's what denoise will do on its own. Oh, look at that. Got rid of all the crud. Yeah. How great is that? Uh, and then we'll do it again. We'll we'll chain it through the speckle. That looks like probably not much of a difference, but you'll know in the out in the final output it'll get little fireflies. And then we'll just plug that into the composite at the end. We're and I would assume like that these things, like as you're piping through these things, you're gonna lose some fine details potentially. So if like there's something you you might have to adjust the settings a bit to yeah, just, tweak these. just to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, but but the defaults kind of seem to do the right thing for <laughs> for this. If there are any blender experts out there watching this, they're probably cringing like, oh, why didn't you use the <laughs> whatever thing that I don't know about? I don't know. There's a lot of things I don't know. Um but you can do color correction, you can all kinds of portions and crazy cool things. Um, yeah, I mean, what's cool is so far everything uh, everything you've done here on stream is just completely unrelated to like this is all just normal Blender stuff. Like you you can use this for any scenes you're creating for any reason in Blender. Yeah. Um, so the the only thing you need to do now is render this out um, to get that final image. Um, and to do that, you want to do one thing first. You want to make sure that under here on the properties uh output properties set the resolution of this render you know it's a 10 that it such 1024 by 1024 so that when i do the render it it's not stretched to some weird size or something and all you have to do is go up to the main menu here hit render render image it will very quickly just spit that out um now you can see yeah the small parts have some kind of crud happening here so rendering at a higher setting probably would have helped me with some of that uh, but in the interest of time I'm just going to go save as and I'm going to uh, call this one light bake uh, moist and I will have a little compression on it or whatever. Um, there's there's some discussion going on in chat basically about um, you know whether you want to apply textures to the thing before light baking um, like I think, I think that really depends. I, I think um, your texture will be used as part of the light baking process. Like so, like your base color texture. Like if you apply a brick texture, or whatever, that is going to be used as part of the light baking process. And so, um, you know, if you have a texture and you want to apply it, I think that's that yeah, do is it. good to yeah. And, I, and, I'm doing really basic stuff here, like yeah. just like a white room with nothing in it. But I will show you in a minute a couple little tweaks you can do. So. What I'm going to do uh, before I move on is switch, uh, just so you can see it in here, from the light bake start image I made to this denoised version. Look at that. Oh. <laughs> I do have some artifacts. Eh, it's a little ugly there. Probably. Be yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, like if you uh, if you actually do more real iterations, that's going to be better than um, the denoising. The render, so it's, yeah. it's just about kind of striking a balance. Like you kind of render as long as you can afford to and then and then denoise to clean afford it up. slash stomach yeah yeah Sometimes that's what I mean, I'm like, my yeah. patience is low and i'm like yeah you know what nobody's gonna get that close i don't care but <laughs> uh if it was for client work or something like that yeah I yeah i mean i know uh, when we uh the, the previous stream we did was with the um the people from apart posters and they actually spent um you know they they were spinning up amazon it's gpu instances to do their light baking and uh, so they kind of did it in the cloud, and it still took them, you know, multiple hours to bake the scene. Um, but you know, they didn't have this denoising stuff either. So, yeah. uh, so this is not what I'm going to do. This is actually not what I'm going to export. I only plugged it in to the, just the preview. No, just so you could see what it'll kind of look like and what I expect. What I do want to do is unplug it um, and show you the new, the new hotness. And now, if you have installed the Hub's Blender exporter. Uh, you will have under your add menu inside the shader a hubs thing and a node called Moz Lightmap Settings. This is the node the DOM made, a little node, and you just plug the color of your light map into it. And you can actually adjust the intensity uh, there. Now you won't see anything in the viewport. Um, but when yeah, we go to export. This doesn't show anything, but. This will work because we're using the light map UV. 
that's very important. Yep. And basically like our, our exporter just during the export process is going to look through all your materials and look for this node. And if it finds one, it knows that it needs to include this light map in, in uh, the GLTF. Now, if you want to kind of get a, thing. kind of get a preview of what it might look like, obviously you can still plug this in here just while you're, while you're working. Like, okay, that's what it look like. Um, if you do have actual textures, like some people were talking about on your object. So for example, if I go find a texture of mine, I have some that I use for the uh, architecture kit. So like, let me grab these bricks. Now these are not going to look good. They're going to be big and probably facing all kinds of weird directions. Um, and it's going to be across the whole model. But if I plug the bricks into it, it doesn't look And then make sure you bad. set the UV, the... Well, yes. I guess it'll default, default to the first the UV The default channel, is so. using the first UVs, which is what I wanted. Um, but if you do that, um, let me let me uh, add a UV map node again. Make sure I'm explicitly first set of UV. That's a good idea. Good good practice. So the main main base color is the main texture is using regular UV. The light map is using light map UV. Um, now we support that. So when this gets exported, it'll have bricks and the lighting. It'll have both, which is pretty awesome. And if you want to preview that, you could add a, like a mix RGB here and plug in the, uh, the, the light map. So you can kind of get a look at what it'll look like combined, what it'll end up looking like in Spoke or in Hubs. Um, you may have to play around with some of the settings in here, like changing it to. I don't yeah, know I mean, it's it's not going to be exact, but this overlay, is a good a good way to just kind of preview. Turning it up, that's a little extreme, but you kind of get the idea of like where it's going to end up. Um, but in the end, you don't need that at all. You just like plain and know that you have your light map plugged in. Make sure your images are all saved. And if you go back to rendered mode now, like if you look at the actual like uh, rendered output um, in the viewport, um, it it should look pretty similar to what you were you were ending up with with the light map. Yep. But you don't have to render anymore. Exactly. Kind of be done with that that view. Um, and so the last thing that I'll do is export this. I'll just go to file, export, GLTF. The default is a GLB. I know you can't see the screen right now. So all this link. I will make sure the settings that I'm only exporting selected object, which is all I have anyway. And I want to make sure that the hubs components are turned on in there. Now, if I go a uh, oak. <laughs> oak, there we are. Over in spoke, good old spoke. I'm going to delete uh, anything I have in here I don't care about. I'm going to drag in from under my assets, drag in my model, and also hit the little upload button. I'm this either, but I'm browsing DLB that I just exported. Oh, there's something playing. So do you see it? I think. Okay. okay. Is there a YouTube video? Well, um, I can't tell if it's me locally. I think it's you locally, maybe. It's probably me locally, yeah. Um, so there it is. It's in my assets. And I can just say place object at origin. And place it exactly how it was. Right size and scale. Um, and I light map. Why don't I? What did I do wrong? What did I miss? Nothing like live troubleshoot. <laughs> it map is on. Texture there. Oh, because I used a principled BSDF node. Ah, oh, right, the background node, yep. You got to remember that because we're not doing a physically based uh, render anymore, you don't care about the lights that are in spoke making it look natural or whatever. Um, don't want a principled BSDF node anymore. In fact, you can delete it, and instead you want the node called background. Now I talked about this in the 
tutorials, but unfortunately the background node is not where in here. Um, I realized I have to go back over to that. Sorry. I got rid of the BSDF node. Uh, let me add it again. Because I so this was all hooked up, and then it didn't work correctly was because it was using principled BSDF node, which I do not need anymore. Delete it, and instead, in its place, I need a background node. And if you don't have a background node listed, you can find it back in that world tab where we set up the skybox. Either just copy and paste it from here, or you can go into your add menu, find the background node, and right click and add it to your quick favorite. That's what I did. Now, whenever I'm in my, you may have seen me do this before, I just hit Q and this little handy menu popped up. I'm like, oh, background node. Pop and now in. by using the background node, what you're doing, uh, the GLTF exporter looks for this specifically, um, and then it knows to use the unlit uh, extension for uh, the material instead of just using the default uh, PBR material. Exactly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna export it again with the same settings I did before. I need to take the one out of Oak. Doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drag it in again. By the way, this um, file is a little over three megs. It's not very big. And 24 textures, one for the bricks um, and one for the light map. Now, uh, there's a couple ways you could replace this if you wanted. A lot of people don't know this workflow. Um, if you have a different model in here, you can drag and drop it over the URL and it'll replace it with it. Look at that. Oh. Bam. And the beauty of this is that I have no lights in this scene whatsoever. I only have the skybox, which doesn't match the actual skybox I used. So you may want to play around with like where the light is from out there if you care. Um, I don't really care, but you could play around with like the, the luminance and the time of day and whatever, try to get the sun to look like it's in the spot. Or you could an actual 360 image uh, as your background. Um, and you you do probably want a uh, at least a directional light or something in the scene. So this someone was actually asking about this offline before the stream. They couldn't couldn't make it, but um, the basically for avatars and for objects that you might bring into the scene, um, having at least like one dynamic light uh, in the scene is going to be useful. And and you know probably try to line it up with you know the general light direction in 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 the scene. So like. For this, you'd, you'd want it to kind of line up with where, where the sun's coming from. Um, and that'll make sure that the avatars and, and dynamic objects at least get kind of some somewhat consistent lighting. Like they're not going to get the shadows applied to them uh, that, that, that are in the light map or anything like that. Um, but at least they'll kind of be somewhat consistently lit with the scene. Exactly. Because um, so if, if, you you, if you have no light, it's going to be it's going to be quite dark. If you have object. some some object in here. Uh, I'm looking to so many like test things that are like that helpful. I'll, just, <laughs> I'll throw this couch in here. So, um, like, it, you know, if this if this object were in here and it's set to shadows and cast shadows and all that kind of stuff, you may want to just try to eyeball your lighting. To, like, yeah, I mean, I think you could you like the like background a little bit. Yeah, like if you set the building to cast shadows, um, and then set the couch to receive shadows, um. I think you would get somewhat consistent things, at least on non-mobile platforms. Um, if you have it on low quality mode, there's no real time shadows. Um, but ideally, like if you want to, you know, you want to set up a scene with light mapping, you kind of lay out most of it in in um, in Blender, so that then you know the light map can be applied to everything. But there's always going to be real time objects like avatars and um, you know images, ducks, whatever you bring in at, at runtime that that can't be light mapped. Um, it's a little hard to cast shadows on a uh, unlit thing like this uh, room, um, mm -hmm. but you know it, it just depends on how accurate you really want to get um, the the couch. Um, should cast shadows or not? You, may, you know, but again, like if I were really designing this room to have specific furniture in it and all that stuff, and it wasn't going to be used for like lots of different, then I probably would put those in Blender exactly. and bake it with those objects in it. Um, just to get the lighting 
exactly. Yeah, like for the scene, um, the scene Christian made for Mozilla All Hands, and we just recently released um, kind of the unbranded version of it. Um, most of the scene was laid out in Blender, um, but then there were kind of some and, and, and light maps, but then some additional pieces were added in Spoke so that they could easily be swapped out for people wanting to use the scene. And then those, you know, those don't get light mapped, but I think it's it's kind of like trade offs basically. Now, the, the beauty of this, though, I, I have to emphasize, right click with you, is we go back to Blender and decided, you know, it's just the brick isn't doing it for me. Um, it's very easy now to go in, change the bricks to something else. Like, what if I wanted these, uh, I don't know, what do I have here? Plaster or like favor. Oh, he's like red looking. Um, check this out. I can just change that texture. I'm not changing the lighting. I'm not rebaking anything. I'm just going to um, save it as a different file. And I'm going to go back to Spoke. And uh, I'll just replace it. Let me import that model texture on and I'm just going to replace uh, this baked room with that one and check it out boom same lighting uh, from texture mm -hmm. and so because they're on independent UV maps uh, that is the beauty of it and also now like if you zoom in look at the detail in this time not yeah exactly you're able that. you're able to use like a, the full resolution because you're able to tile that brick texture um, and you don't have to have it over you know on the entire like unique UV space, um, you can you can use a much higher resolution, or actually a much lower resolution texture than you would have had to use before, but get a much higher resolution result. Yeah. Um, now you might wonder, well, if the brick was red, wouldn't the light bounce differently? Yeah, probably. And it would, and and so like if you do rebake your lighting, um, that will happen. So like if you if you go rebake it with this texture, you'll actually get kind of a different result because the surfaces are going to be different and they're going to reflect light differently. Um, based on that texture. So like if you were doing this for real, like you might want to rebake that, but you know, like, especially for quickly iterating, um, I mean, this looks fine. <laughs> so, yeah. Like I, I, I think the point is basically you're, you're, you know, you're not, you're not stuck with making a choice early on, you know, uh, that, that's what I really like about this. Now your lighting is sort of divorced from what color textures you what resolution textures you have. So now while I was just talking there, I did a third one and I, we could just drop them all in separate, I guess, but um, I'll replace it, you know, now with this like granite tile texture. Try on different looks and iterate pretty quickly uh, without having to worry about like, oh God, I got to rebake all those. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's how it works. Um, I do want to show one last thing before I move on or before I go ahead and ask questions. That's totally cool. Um, I do want to show something that I think a lot of people don't know about. Uh, how do I know people don't know about it? I don't know. I didn't know about it. That's, that's why <laughs> I'm making a lot of assumptions. It's not really fair. Uh, let's get rid of the, the texture for a second. And one thing that uh, I've recently learned that, is really really helpful, especially when you're iterating early on, is using vertex color. Now, vertex color is something that Hubs has always supported, Spoke has always supported, and is has always pretty much always been supported by GLTF. Um, and it doesn't require any actual texture maps to use. This is really really nice when you are experimenting. Like, what would it look like with like a green wall over there, or like what would it look like with a different color floor? Or just trying to get basic you know, lighting done or whatever. And so um, in order to do that, what am I back? Uh, sorry, did I go back to Blender? Yeah, I did. Yep. Like paranoid that I'm <laughs> doing like 40 steps and everybody. Uh, so you can use vertex color. Now alongside edit mode, which is a tab, it goes back and forth between object and edit mode. Up here, instead of using edit mode, you can switch to one called vertex paint. Now, vertex paint is really cool because you can actually paint each vertex or each face a different color, um, which is kind of special. It doesn't do it with texture. It's actually adding color information to the 
And the way this works is kind of an old school game technique, but it really works well for this. So if you, at the top, you can switch between face or vertex mode or none. I like using face mode for this. Uh, when you're in face mode, you can do whatever button you use to select. In my case, I'm a, I'm a right click guy. So um, I can do things like select, uh, let's do the alcove here. Like I can select the, these faces of that wall I, I use shift to select them all. And then inside the uh, the vertex paint tool, which is either here under tool or it's done in, under the, um, you pick a color. So if I was like, oh, I want a nice like blue wall back there. And the easiest thing to do is while this is selected, just paint set vertex colors or shift K is the default. And you can color it. And when you switch back to object mode, you may not see it. And that's because in the default uh, shading mode, um, you need to turn on for text. Um, but you will see it in rendered mode. So when you switch. Uh, and it should actually combine it um, with the the material as well, right? Going on. Oh, because a shader is now using a background shader. So when you go back to working again, you may have to. Uh, switch your shaders around. Go back to the yeah. That's one kind of annoying thing we have still, where because of the kind of the way this works, there's this process of like, okay, I'm working and I'm baking, and then you have to do kind of something separate for um, for actually exporting. Um, one technique that might be helpful for that is actually just creating multiple materials and then maybe swapping the materials. Um, not really sure what, what we can do there to make that easier. Yeah. Um, now, in order to see vertex colors in on your rendered object. There is actually a node for that, and it's called vert, vertex color. There's a vertex color node that lets you pick your vertex colors. The default one, when you make one, is called all color, and it's under under UV maps here. It's vertex color. There they are, saved. And you can plug that into your base color, and then check it out. Oh, I got my blue wall. And so you and could you... you could do that while. Uh, and then bake your light map again, a blue wall, or like, you know, see what it looks like with settings. And you can combine this too, like this was mentioned in chat, you can combine this with the textured stuff to actually, you know, the, the example mentioned in chat is you have a, a city with a bunch of different buildings and you can make them different colors by, by just applying vertex colors. Um, but even for this brick, the brick texture you already had, you can tint that blue um, in that area um, just by having, using vertex colors. Yeah, and you can mix using this mix RGB. Right, the mix right? RGB. Yep. Be like, oh, let's plug in, let's mix between those two, and then I'll put that. Now I'll get my granite tile. With blue granite tile on the wall with there. Blue. There it is. Um, doesn't look that awesome, but you <laughs> kind of get the point. Um, you can see it. It's just um, deciding how you're going to use these together, whether you multiply mode. Settings up, whatever. So vertex colors, I use a lot um, when I'm just trying to lay in, like, what does it look like if the light's bouncing off a, an orange floor instead of a, a plain white floor or something? And I just want to get ideas out quickly. And the cool thing about that is that you don't have to bake the vertex color into a texture first. You can do that, um, but you don't have to. In fact, when you export this model as is, or, or up with the background node and all that um, vertex colors come along with it and they'll, they'll show up in spoke or hubs uh, there's a question in chat like do the vertex colors um, factor into the light baking uh, and bouncing they do um, I think they do and, and if, I think it's an option you if can you, you can plug them in like this they do yeah and you can you can configure that as well I think in the render settings too maybe probably uh, yeah but certainly, yeah, if you plug it in here, like whatever you're seeing in the rendered view is kind of what is used for, for light baking. I'm going to switch back to this modeling view again, and I'm going to uh, color the floor like a, like a darker color, just so you can see that. So I'm going to switch into uh, weight paint, there's no, vertex paint mode, um, select some of the squares on the floor here. I'm going to make them like bright red. Um, set them, and then I'm going to go back uh, to heating and 
Yeah, so so you can see the red bouncing up onto the mm -hmm. from that. And if you rebaked your lighting, like that would that would apply into the light map and all that. Yep. So that's uh, vertex colors are really handy for stuff like this. Um, so if you're if you're making a scene for hubs and it's like, you know, it's sort of minimalist and and uh, you're not really concerned about specific you know detail textures and stuff like if you just want to do what i did initially with no base color textures and you just do it with colors like this even that with good lighting can look fantastic if you've ever played the original um mirror's edge game like so much of that world was like yeah. white and colors and then bounced lighting around um to help you know where to go and stuff like that and it it, it looks amazing um just as a stylistic choice but um, I kind of like it just because it's fast. And I'm lazy a lot of the time. And I don't want to have to make a lot of textures and wrangle them. Um, but it also makes download sizes smaller. Uh, if you don't have to download a bunch of textures, all the better. The only ones you would really have to download are the uh, the light maps themselves. Yep. It's, uh, and, and, you know, getting different... Um variations of textures is, is like that's a great way to not have to create multiple images just to have different different variants i'm switching views just because um <laughs> wondered if yeah any other questions coming in i don't i'm i haven't been following um yeah i've been trying to trying to relay most of the questions but yeah um texture memory yeah exactly there's a lot of savings that happened with all this stuff so um, maybe make it a checkered floor. Yeah, we could do that. We could. Uh, we haven't broken anything yet, so we could try applying a uh, UV scroll to the entire environment. Oh, well, that one's cool. I <laughs> forgot about that. That is one of the one of the cool um, cool new components that Dom um, worked. So, uh, UV scrolling. If you haven't seen it yet, um, is this? I'm switch over. To, um, let me just switch over to spoke or hubs really quick um, so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, wait. The nonsense. Okay, so if I uh, open up a scene, oh, I have this cool UV scrolling scene. It has it all in there. Uh, hopefully it's all still there. And another, another question in chat. So, so basically asking about um, how this light map exports. So we created a... Um, we talked about this earlier in the stream. We created a GLTF uh, extension. Um, it's you know Moz uh, Moz Lightmap, I believe. Um, that it will export into that. Um, you would need in, in order to load it into 3GS, you would need some custom code that we have in Hubs uh, to load it. But um, it is just in the GLTF file, and it is just a normal GLTF extension. That and the the code to um, to load it is very very minimal. Literally, it's just looking. When it's loading material, it just says like, "Oh, does this have a light map?" If it does, it plugs it directly into 3GS light map. There's no custom shaders or anything like that we have to write. We're just using the normal 3GS light mapping stuff. The um the so the scrolling the UV scroll component looks like this, and you can put it on any mesh that has textures of of any kind, pretty much. Um, and it has a couple settings: the X speed and the Y speed, um, where this hub scene will kind of demonstrate what that does. Um, this is scrolling a texture, uh, it's full length, uh, one time per second. That's right. Am I right about that, Tom? Uh, I think it's... Like from zero to one? Yes, it's how, it, I think it, if you put a value of one, that means it'll scroll through the entire UV map once per second. Yeah, so you can see a lot better on the vertical because of that dark line. Um, and if you do it on more than one axis, you know you can set different speeds. And um, question in chat: Does it does it have an input to specify which UV? No, it's just um, the default. Because of yeah, because of how UV offsets work in 3JS, um, you can it's just all or nothing. Um, so it applies to everything, um, but the light map, which is actually kind of a cool feature because um, your normal map and your, your roughness map, all that stuff will scroll. Um, but if you have a light map, it will not scroll, um, which can actually be a pretty cool effect. Then it looks like your lighting is static. And mm -hmm. um, I just did a couple of fancy things here where like, I distorted the UVs a little bit so that when the texture scrolled, it appeared to wobble. And this is um, a common like old game technique. A lot of the old Nintendo games did 
Um, and if you do the same exact thing with a texture, cooler texture like water, um, create the illusion of things or old things. Or if you scroll along a 3D object, um, get different effects like mountain or make all in a room. Um, so these are all really kind of simple models and the scrolling in one direction, but the UVs themselves have been like pushed and pulled out of alignment, pull and change speed. Um, and this technique is, I don't know, it's a, it's a really old technique and it's still awesome. Games still use it. Um, in the case of this, this is this is the texture at the top here. This is a one by sixteen pixel texture, and the UVs are all scrunched down into like one pixel of space on the map. And so you can imagine if my cursor right here is the UV, they're just scrolling across in a loop. Um, and the effect is that you've got a blinking object. It's just changing from red to black. Um, in this case, I made more of a gradient, and so you get more of a, a pulsing effect as you scroll. So these techniques are really cool, and if you do it on something like this texture at the top, where the U, each square is moving along its own row, um, create like a disco floor or something like that, um, some kind of display. And what's great about these is like just they're they're really cheap. Um... You know, computationally, because it's just all we're doing is setting a UV offset. It's a single uniform we're passing into the shader. So it's like, it's, you know, you can do these things without, uh, I mean, right now or before we introduce this stuff, for, to do this, um, a lot of people are creating videos and those are the opposite of lightweight. Those are like one of the heaviest things you can like put a into whole hubs. Room, a whole room where every wall was, a yeah, video there was, screen. you know, people to create a disco floor, they would just like plaster it with like a bunch of videos. And it's just like performance wise, that's really, really bad. Um, So Especially uh, in mobile. this is much, much better. And then here's like an example of like, Four different things scrolling um, create the illusion. I'm sitting. I still want to make a scene out of something like that. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. And remember, it, right now those things are just scrolling on flat planes, but they don't have to be flat. It could be a curved mm -hmm. background element, like a row of something that looked like they're going around a curve. Or something. Those just have and, a, um... a simple alpha channel. And since you made this scene, we also added a new feature to the UV scroll component, which is uh, increment. So you can set um, specific discrete increments to um, to to snap the UV uh, mo like scrolling to. And what you can use that for is to uh, I think you probably don't have the latest Blender add-on, uh, so I don't know if it'll be in there. I don't think but, it will um, be. Yeah. Um, but if you if you get the latest one, uh, you'll get that, and um, it basically it'll allow you to snap to different increments, and that can allow you to do like sprite animations. Um, you know if you split up your UV into to some discrete segments, you can actually have it. So instead of going smoothly from zero to one, you can say, set the increment to 0.25 and then it'll go, it'll go zero, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, uh, one. And so you can actually set it to snap to, to increments. That's very, very, very cool. I'm going to set this back to the bricks and I'm going to add the UV scroll component so we can the, see this. Uh, John was asking in chat, does the disco floor use the snapping thing? Uh, it does not. So like that was actually written before uh, the snapping thing. It, um, it's achieving that effect just by the nature of like what the texture looks like. You know, it, it's going to scroll smoothly across and it'll stay on one color for six pixels and then it'll go into another color for six pixels. And, you know, so it, it kind of achieves that through the texture. Um, but if you wanted to say have a bunch of discrete separate images like frames of an animation or something like that, um, you would need to use the snapping thing. The scrolling thing wouldn't be enough. So I'm going to make sure that uh, the scrolling, I, I added a, the UV scroll component to my room and mm -hmm. I put the bricks back on it. And then I just have to make sure when I export that the hubs components are on order, which and you are. need to put it back to the uh, unlit texture. Yeah. <laughs> it got me. Yeah, that that part is really like I if if people have suggestions of like a way we can make this um, this process easier, um, you know, because I know when when Christian was iterating on that that all hands scene, he had kind of a process that he was using um, for just kind of switching the outputs of a node, um, and then I wrote him a little Python script that he can use to to <laughs> to toggle them all. But like you know, well, I, yeah, one thing that I sort of learned recently that was kind of like a duh moment where I was like, oh. I didn't realize that you can have more than one material output like this. Mm -hmm. And if you, 
set one of them to cycles and one of them to EV. Like mm. you can you can say this is only for rendering and this one's only I see. for you know. So yeah, I don't, I don't know, know if that's well going to confuse the GLTF exporter. Like the because the GLTF exporter does like it's pretty strict about what the material graph looks like and because it's like expecting certain things and if it even sees a background node at all, then it's going to make your thing unlit, even if it's not connected. Like, I think there's, there's a bunch of stuff like that. That's um, why I've kind of avoided it. I would just try it. Like I, you honestly just try it and see what works. Um, you can't really break anything. Yeah. I mean, it, like if your file doesn't export correctly, then you, you'll, you'll see that, that it's broken, but. Okay. So um, I just, I just added my UV scrolling and also this has vertex colors in it. Right. And so, it's worth noting that UV scrolling, you're not gonna be able to preview that in spoke. Uh, you won't see the UV scroll happen. Uh, but if you publish to hubs, then even if you, you hit preview, see... yeah, that I, I it's just not implemented. Show in there, but that's okay. Um, but we can publish this to hubs, and there, check it out. I got my my yeah, colors, and that's colors pretty cool. Like, that's a cool red brick carpet, beautiful red brick and uh, <laughs> painted wall, sort of with with no red bounces, bounces, make it but right, whatever kind of gets the point across. If you were making a template and you were like, look, this is the room with this event in it red floor room mm -hmm. a quick way to do it extra baking so i'm going to take this i'm going to publish to hubs uh i'm going to call this uh streaming on um i'm not going to make this fixable or whatever but i'm just going to say publish it look at all that low everything said low it was no problem Roll work. Is it rolling? Let's see. Like I oh, said, we do. Oh, look at that. And oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, this will make you dizzy. But it's a cool room. Look, everything's. Glad I only set it to point one. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's scrolling in all sorts of different directions, and that's just kind of based on what the UV map, um, how, you the, know, the, how how that's those laid out. First set of UVs were laid out. Yep. So if I wanted my like these walls over here to have the bricks sideways, I'd have to of course go back into Blender and line them up. So and you could even do the stuff you did where um you know you can make the the UVs wobbly and so you could have the bricks kind of all wobbling. Um, like like a I noticed for some reason the light map isn't applying and I think uh this is the bug you sent me yesterday is that when you were using vertex colors light maps weren't working. Um, oh that's right. And, and so that's good. It's still happening. <laughs> the bug is consistent. Yes. Um, um, so if I turn off vertex colors, you're saying that might like in the in the exporter. That would be the guess. I mean, that that's what you were saying yesterday with, when you were trying to use a model with vertex colors. You were having issues with lighting, and then we looked into it, and I, I didn't get I didn't really get a chance to look into it yesterday because we were looking into it. Yeah, the, the good news is you can just turn off um, uh, vertex colors in the exporter itself. I mean, I just did it, exported it. I mean, it's working in spoke, so it's probably, it's it's potentially a, um, I wonder if it's a spoke exporting issue, like because of combining materials and that sort of stuff. I'll just republish. Let's see if it works. That's it. Then we know it's a bug and everybody gets to see how we diagnose. But yeah, definitely we'll we'll uh I'll add that to my to-do list to look into and now we have an example file that we know that. also That's... breaks. So Oh, also the scrolling wasn't showing in this loading uh, in the scene in yeah. the lobby. Yeah. That's another clue maybe. But now look, the the texture scroll but the light map does not. Yep. Which is really messing with my brain when I look down like this. I feel it's like a I'm going little way. <laughs> yeah. a little bit and I'm not and then I'm like, "Oh, this is weird." But I want to make like a cool uh, room that makes you feel like you are. Going. I think I've almost succeeded at here. Yeah, this is a scary, scary place you've made. I like it. But without a lot of effort, I think that's kind of uh, the theme here. Yeah, and like I said, most of the most of the kind of techniques you went over are just general blender lighting, light baking stuff. Um, the the only kind of hub specific part was like the very end where you had to add that that light map node. Um, but other yep. than that, this is just kind of how you do lighting in Blender. Um, but it definitely was uh, super useful. Those other tutorials you did were definitely super useful for when I was testing this light mapping stuff, just because oh, it was there, there's so much stuff out there. Um, 
but a lot of it's outdated or just kind of covering some different things, but just having a, a really straightforward, um, you know, overview of how to do, how to do this stuff in Blender is, is super helpful. I'm, I'm going to do hopefully. one last thing because you said it before and now I got to see it and it's very easy to do where we ripple the EVs. Uh, in case you're wondering like a, a quick and dumb way to do it, uh, you can go into your um, UV editing mode, make sure you have like any any and all UVs you want to mess with. Um, not the light map UV, you want the regular regular old UV. Yeah, do not move the light map UVs, that would be really bad. So again, here's in case people were wondering and they were like, I don't like the vertical bricks over here. If you want to change all that, you could find all the ones that you don't like um that are going the the you know, wrong direction whatever you want to call it um and they get selected over here and then you could just rotate each one so like you could take this one and just type r90 uh, i'm going to do it over and over again um and now that now the bricks are going right direction um <laughs> of course they'll scroll left to right now because that's the direction Role is set but it's okay that they overlap with these other UVs. It just really doesn't matter, um, except for the fact that like I want these going horizontally well. Right. So you know you may want to go through like this. And yeah, I mean since this is a tiling texture, like a lot of these you could overlap. Uh, like doesn't does they don't really have to be spread out like this. Um, right. Um, I could also like select one face of all these window parts. Hit Control L, which will select all the linked parts like that them all at once and then R9 rotate them in. So whatever, you, you, could, you could go through and do all that. Now, if you want to make them like wavy and interesting, uh, they don't have a lot of like in-between um, vertices or anything. So it's not going to be as cool as like the waterfall, but I can select all like this and play around with the, um, what's it called? Proportional editing. It's a little like, hmm target looking thing at the top and change it to like smooth or random or whatever. If you choose random, then if you grab like one vertex or, or a set of them, like, like a set of vertices and then hit G to move them. Um, you can see in the lower right, uh, the floor is getting funky there. Uh, but yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. But you can, when you go to move it, if you scroll your mouse, you can actually like or at once. So if I do right, this, so you kind of just mash up the whole. You can kind of do like, <laughs> a quick and dirty, like just grab and pull, and they're moving kind of in amounts. Yeah. Then now, if you scroll that, and you should show the the kind of technique you can use to sort of preview what uh, UV scrolling looks like in Blender, just by grabbing all of the the whole UV map and then just sliding yeah, it back just, and forth. Yeah, I just grab them all. I'm turning off. And then I hit like GX and slide it. Get an idea and so you can kind of get an idea of what, what it's going to look like when it's scrolling. That wasn't as cool as I hoped it was. <laughs> eh, I don't know. I give up. But at least I showed you how to like fix your direction. So like these guys that are bugging me. Select them. Far enough. Now, granted, you know, these are all uh, proportional, but like the bricks on this wall could be bigger if I scale this down or mm -hmm. smaller if I scale it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is like, like, this is the kind of thing you like totally could not do by baking the light map into. Um, oh, God. You'd be like, UVs. like, you would so not be able to do any of this. You'd have to go back and read it all, mm -hmm. change the texture. But yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, R90. So now my walls are upright. All right, close enough. Um, export. And probably. Okay, yeah, I think we're back. we're uh, we're coming up on about two hours. So if anyone has any last minute questions, I think yeah, that I think was, this that is long. this is what we wanted to cover. But yeah, it's good. <laughs> and I think what we'll try to do is we'll try to cut out some clips from this. Um, you know, of, of kind of specific uh, questions or kind of just little specific techniques. 
um, and then maybe maybe try to get some of this stuff uploaded to our YouTube channel. But um, yeah, this Twitch stream is a way we could we could get out all this information without having to go through a bunch of editing and, and all that sort of stuff because uh, that you know that takes a long time. The, those those tutorial videos are great, but they took a long time to produce. Yeah, a lot of editing and yeah, doing. I said the right thing. Um, oh, they're, not my walls look nice. They're going the right way. Yeah, so there you, there you have it. Um, and then anywhere where the where the bricks aren't lining up, like over here, it's just because I didn't, I accidentally separated this. They're, they're not, they're just not like, you know, exactly aligned in the, mm -hmm. wow, that corner really messes with the brain. Yeah, that looks really weird. <laughs> so I feel like it's shrinking on me. It's like pulling. But uh, um, someone asked in chat, is there any way to create a reposition of the nav mesh entity at the origin? Um, so I think the, the nav mesh in spoke is generated. Uh, there's a little button in spoke to regenerate the nav mesh. Um, I think if that's what you're asking. Uh, the, I don't think the position of the nav mesh actually. The floor plan the, the itself. Nav, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's called the floor plan and then you could just reposition. I don't think the floor plan has a position that matters no in fact if you it doesn't have a, a transform at all like there's no right position exactly position or rotation for it uh, we did that on purpose because it was too easy to accidentally move it and then we'll be yeah. like, why is everything offset i don't know why it made floor plan up there mm. uh, unless it made it on the roof side effect this is something we could probably cover in another stream. Would be to kind of how do you how to make a custom uh, navigation mesh? Yeah, uh, we should write that down as another topic. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody. First, thanks Dom for taking all this time uh, going through. This oh, this was cool, and I definitely learned a lot too. Just uh, <laughs> just watching people work in Blender, you always kind of learn uh, learn different things. Yeah, it's um, you know, always a, a learning process. I I know um, it's taken me a while to to learn all the ins and outs of Blender, but um, uh, f I, I still am standing by our decision to really double down on, on supporting Blender and and its use with hubs and spoke because I think it's just a, a good fit um, mm -hmm. and it allows us to extend our tooling into a a, a a 3D app that we don't have to worry about changing all the time or like you know. yeah and I mean and I think uh, you know spoke and, and Blender um, go hand in hand like I think we're, we'll we'll try to work on the workflows more to make that even easier but um, you know. Spoke is about compositing your scene, putting it together, bringing in, bringing in all the assets, configuring them, that sort of stuff. And then Blender is about like the more low level creating uh, the raw assets. Um, so I think they actually, uh, you know, work together really well. Yeah, and hopefully there's enough information there that if you did pull a model from somewhere else, and you're not too timid, and you feel like, hey, you know, I think I could clean this up and and make it work for hubs or for for whatever project I'm doing. Um, a lot of the techniques I showed, like, like Dom said, they're really just straight up blender and 3d mm -hmm. techniques. They're not, you know, unique to, to hubs or spoke or anything. So, um, you know, if you feel like there's this model that's like almost perfect, but doesn't quite have what you need, or you need to remove a, a piece from it or something or extend mm -hmm. it, you know, it's not, it's not that hard. Don't be afraid. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, like uh, Trevor was asking in chat too, like these are, these are just GLTF extensions. Like they're, you know, you can... Uh, if you're writing another app or whatever, you can you know write support for our, the Mozilla Lightmap extension, and then you know use this exporter for your stuff too. And same thing with the hubs components, because the components don't actually contain any code or anything like that. They're just the kind of information of the, of the properties you fill out. You could uh, use this for your own your own projects as well. So yeah, very cool. All right. Well, sweet. Yeah. Thanks everybody for for checking us out and. Um, yeah, we'll have this video available elsewhere soon. But uh, we'll see you in the Discord and in hubs and our meetups. Remember, our meetups are usually every Friday um, at uh, 11.30 Pacific time. Uh, 11.30 a.m., I should say, Pacific time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, if you want to talk to me and Dom and whoever else on the hubs team might be there, um, yeah, drop by and, and whether you have a headset or not. <laughs> and we'll talk cool. to you later. Yep, see you in hubs. <laughs> Bye-bye.